Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Okay, dear listeners, welcome to this exciting edition of So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. If you're new to the show, I am your host, Nico Perino. Before I turn to the subject of today's conversation, I want to update our regular listeners about the upcoming special 100th episode that I briefly discussed at the beginning of the last show. In short, we're still doing it. Jonathan Rausch, Nadine Strawson, Greg Lukianoff, and Bob Korn Revere will still join me for a wide ranging conversation about the state of free speech in America. However, I've torpedoed the idea of doing a live show. It's just too difficult to organize for right after Thanksgiving, and what's more, we really don't have the space. That said, we will still plan to live stream the conversation when it takes place at 3.30 p.m. on Wednesday, December 4th. That is, if the internet cooperates with us. So stay tuned to our social media accounts for a link to that live stream. And if for whatever reason the internet isn't working, I will let you know of that on our social media accounts as well. Now, for those of you who can't watch the conversation live, the video and audio will still be released through our normal channels on our normal publication date of Thursday December 12th. As for today's show, I thought it would be a good idea to finally, finally look into the life and philosophy of the English philosopher John Stuart Mill, whose 1859 book on liberty is a classic, maybe the classic text on free expression. Many of my most repeated quotes in defense of free speech principles come from this Mill text. For example, his line that both teachers and learners go to sleep at their post as soon as there is no enemy in the field, and his contention that to refuse a hearing to an opinion because you are sure that it is false is to assume that your certainty is the same thing as absolute certainty. Also, his line that he who knows only his side of the case knows little of that is a classic line used by many people in the free speech community. So because we in this community reference Mill so often, and because I reference Mill so often on this podcast, I thought it was about time we get an expert in here to tell us a little bit about the man and what we, what I, get right and wrong about his philosophy. And to Sherpa us on this journey up the mountain of Mill is Dale E. Miller. He is a professor and associate dean for research and graduate studies in the College of Arts and Letters at Old Dominion University. And critically, he is a John Stuart Mill expert, maybe the expert in America, I don't know. But in 2010, he authored the book, John Stuart Mill, Moral, Social, and Political Thought. He's also been a co-editor on a couple of texts about Mill or about Mill's philosophy pertaining to the ideas of utilitarianism, which is something that we will discuss in the course of this episode. Now, the focus of this episode is ostensibly about Mill's book on liberty and in particular, the second chapter. However, we do spend considerable time up front going over Mill's biography and his general political philosophy, which I think is important to understanding Mill's free expression arguments, which will come more in the second half of this show. So hang in there. Now, Professor Miller is a top-notch thinker and a scholar in the truest sense of the word. Indeed, you will often hear him telling me during the course of our conversation that my statements about or understanding of Mill's arguments aren't quite right or that there's more to the story than I initially believed, which is exactly what a discerning scholar should do in a conversation like this. Now, a quick note before we begin, this conversation was recorded over the phone. So if it sounds like a phone conversation, that's because it is. I always like to get that out there and let you know if that's the case. Now, alas, I think that covers everything. So let's get on to the show. All right, Professor Miller, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thanks very much for having me. I want to ask, how did you get interested in the philosophy of John Stuart Mill? You seem to have been working on him and with his works for quite some time now. Well, you know, when I was an undergraduate and even back into high school, I was very much enamored of a kind of libertarian political philosophy. And I guess that by the time I was an undergraduate, the philosopher that I I was most enamored of 
was Robert Nozick and his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. So then I went off to grad school, and in my first year there, I decided I wanted to read more about utilitarianism, which was a you know, very different kind of viewpoint from the one that I was, the one that I had embraced. And I did this kind of in the spirit of wanting to know my, my enemies. So a professor there named Kurt Beyer agreed to do a directed reading with me. And the plan was that we were going to start with the history of utilitarianism and then move on to some more contemporary work. And so we got through a couple of weeks of Jeremy Bentham, who was an earlier utilitarian philosopher than Mill. And actually a teacher of Mill, correct? Well, yeah, I'm not in any formal sense, uh, but, but they were certainly acquainted. Uh, Bentham and Mill's father uh, had a, a close connection for a number of years. And um, Mill, at one point, for example, served as an editor for some of Bentham's work. So we, we, we got through the Bentham, and we got to Mill, and the plan was that we were going to spend two or three weeks on Mill. And every week, I just said, I'd like to do some more of this. Um, I, I, I just really got caught up in Mill. And I think... The reason was that I had never really felt satisfied with the kind of foundations that I had for some of my my views. Um, I was sometimes maybe smugly confident about them, at least in talking with other people. But, you know, I, I believed in all these natural rights, and I never really had a good story about where those things came from. And I felt like Mill offered me more of a foundation for a lot of what I believed and some pretty good reasons to give up the parts that he wasn't giving me foundations for. And so, you know, coming into reading Mill, really seeing him as kind of an opponent, he just won me over. Well, let's talk about utilitarianism very quickly because this is perhaps what he's best known for. And I'm not a philosopher, but my basic understanding of utilitarianism is the idea that what is does the greatest good for the greatest number of people is the best form of government or governance. Is that more or less correct? It's certainly on the right track. Um, that formula, greatest good for the greatest number of people, is kind of misleading. It's it's something that gets tossed around a lot and. Well, I, I would want to fact check this before I said it in print. I think it's true that that actually comes from Bentham, but that he later repented of putting it that way. Mm. It would be better to just say greatest good and let it end with that. Numbers come into it, but it, it's not always a question about what's best for the most people. And so that's what can make that misleading. Well, that's that's interesting because then... Well, I guess in the prior formulation, the one I stated, you also have the same problem, which is how do you define good? Well, now that's going to be an issue no matter what. Yeah. Um, for the utilitarians, roughly speaking, that comes down to a question of what results in the most happiness. Not the most happiness for the person who, whose conduct we're evaluating. Um, or at least not only them, but the most happiness overall, uh, the most happiness taking everyone into account, even in the long run. So that there's a very, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you, you can finish that thought, but there is an, there's an interesting departure, it seems to me, between that principle and the arguments that John Stuart Mill makes in On Liberty which is the book that many of our podcast guests, our listeners, will be most familiar with because his second chapter in that book is one of the best articulations in favor of a free speech philosophy that has ever been written. But I want you to finish that, and I want to, and I actually want to place John Stuart Mill before we we move into that um, at his time, for example, his era. Well, I, I think that where I was going actually is going to address the thing that you're you're already worrying about. I mean, it's it's a good worry to have. There are different 
stripes of utilitarians. One way to be a utilitarian, and this is in some ways the most straightforward way, is to think that on kind of a case-by-case basis, when we're trying to decide whether somebody did the right thing, we should look at whether their action produced the most good. You know, that individual action by that individual person in those specific circumstances. And because philosophers have a name for everything, (laughs) we call that act utilitarianism. A different way to be a utilitarian is to think that we don't apply the standard of producing the greatest good on a case-by-case, action-by-action basis, but instead we use it to evaluate something like moral rules. And we say that the best rules are the rules that it would best promote happiness for people generally to accept. And then when we want to evaluate individual actions and think about whether what a person did on a specific occasion was right or not, what we think about is what that best set of rules would say about their action. So Mm -hmm. we call this rule utilitarianism. And, well, some of my my friends and colleagues would disagree with me about this. I've come to the conclusion that Mill is a rule utilitarian. And I think that this makes it much easier to fit together his utilitarianism and the kinds of arguments that he makes in On Liberty. Yeah, I I would think it would have to be so, because if I am looking at that first strand of liber- uh, of utilitarianism, you could be justified under that philosophy in perhaps stealing a loaf of bread if it's going to feed your family, but only cost the rich merchant 10 cents. Uh, it seems to be that there would be greater good coming from that action, but on a precedential basis, it wouldn't matter because you're looking at everything anew. Um, whereas the second one, uh, if you have John Stuart Mill's philosophy, as he enumerates in On Liberty, which is essentially that the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. And I'm quoting him here. He says that only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. In that case, my example, stealing a loaf of bread, the harm would be in taking from someone else their their property. Uh, and so in that sense, it would break that moral foundation, which Mill would argue should be the guiding principle in society to produce the greatest good. I, th- I think in some sense, in the abstract, you're, you're right. Um, I think it's a mistake to think that the principle that you just read, uh, which today, Mill doesn't use this kind of language, but today people call that the liberty or the harm principle. A very libertarian principle that I'm assuming you're familiar with from your early libertarian readings. Um, I I think it's a mistake to think that, um, that, to say that that principle would um, necessarily condemn somebody in the, the kind of example that you you gave, mm. but it's maybe better to kind of bracket that conversation for now until you're ready to talk more about On Liberty. Yeah. Well, let's just take a few moments here to talk about John Stuart Mill, the man. He was a man who was born in uh, 1806. He was born in London to a father who worked in the East India Company, one of the big mega international corporations of the time. And he was very well educated, correct? John, you mean, was well educated. Yeah, John John, John was well educated. Uh, He had a a very unique education. Um, His his father, when he was born, his father wasn't at the East India Company yet, although he he actually, uh, when John was fairly young, his father wrote a history of the East India Company, and that was essentially his job application. Uh, On the strength of that, they they hired him. Um, John was educated by his father. So he was, to use the language that we would use today, homeschooled. Uh, he essentially never, um, never had any formal outside of the home education. 
And, you know, his education, um, Dickens kind of uh, parodies it in his novel, Hard Times. I mean, it, it was um, kind of, it, it was famous in that James Mill set a very demanding syllabus for him. Um, James had this idea based on his psychological theories that any child could be a genius as long as he got the right kind of early education. You know, that we're, we're born completely blank slates so that as long as you started forming a child's mind in the right way from the very start, you could produce this genius. And so his project for John was that he was going to raise him to become this champion of utilitarian philosophy. And John was a real child prodigy and was doing things like, you know, famously, he says in his autobiography, reading Greek at the age of three, um, he, he really was an enormously accomplished child. Um, it wasn't necessarily the most enjoyable upbringing. Um, we, don't, we don't have any confirmed reports, for example, of John ever playing with a ball, anything <laughs> like that. Um, to some extent, this was driven by himself. I mean, it's not that he had no free time. And even in his free time, he was pretty bookish. So it's, it's not as if um, he had the strong inclination to be doing something other than studying that his father was preventing him from doing. Um, it's the kind of upbringing I always say to my students where you'd expect to read in the London newspapers, you know, 15 years later that this, this fellow had hacked his father to pieces or something like mm. that, um, which didn't happen. Although it is true that when he was about 20, John had a period of depression that affected his thoughts in some way. I mean, and when I say affected his thoughts, I mean, it caused him to reconsider some of the things that had been taught. It made him a different sort of utilitarian than his father had raised him to be. Um, people call it sometimes a, a nervous breakdown. It was nothing like that. He was, he was completely functioning the entire time but he, uh, he was melancholy. And he grew up and ended up going to work for the East India Company like his father. And did he work there his, his, almost his entire life while he was doing the philosophy that he's become so well known for? He worked there until 1858. And in 1858, the British government absorbed the East India Company. Um, and they actually encouraged him to stay with them and to become, you know, essentially a government civil servant. Uh, but, but he declined that and retired at that point. So he worked there until he would have been roughly 52. And he was doing philosophy while he was working there? He was. Um, was he a well-known philosopher? He, he was well-known, although what he was well-known for is not what he's best known for now. So he was well known at the time for two things in particular, I think. One was his work on political economy. And he had a, a major two volume work on political economy that came out, uh, the principles of political economy. Uh, he was also well known as a logician. And he'd had another major two volume work come out, the system of logic, uh, which I say logician uh, because the book has logic in the title. It was really much wider ranging than that and has a lot to say about the nature of language, uh, about knowledge, what today we'd call epistemology. So he was well known for those works. But today when people talk about Mill or when we teach Mill, we're very often teaching the political philosophy like on liberty, the moral philosophy like utilitarianism. He, was wor he, he had written some things in these areas earlier in his life. And the essays that we most often read today, utilitarianism and on liberty, he was working on uh, in the 1850s. But on liberty wasn't published until 1859. Utilitarianism didn't come out until 1861. So he was out of the India house before 
the things that he's famous to us for appeared. Yeah, he left, as you said, in 1858. He wrote On Liberty in 1859. What was... Well, he published it in 1859. Oh, yeah, you said he had been writing yeah, it. Yeah, he, he'd been working on it earlier. And um, he was working on it um, with his wife, uh, Harriet Taylor Mill, who some people would argue, and it's, it's hard for me to know whether they're right or not, um, that she really was a, a co-author of On Liberty. Um, and he essentially says as much in the dedication to the essay, which is the highest praise that you'll ever read being heaped upon any person, uh, hmm. the terms in which he speaks of her. Um, Harriet actually died in 1858. And so at the beginning of the essay, one of the things that Mill says is that it's a tragedy that she was never able to give kind of the last version of the essay uh, going over. Mm. What did he think of his time and of England at this time? Well, he certainly had many frustrations. Um, and it's hard to know where to begin in talking about that. Um, Would he have been seen as a radical would you say? Yeah, I mean, it's somewhat literally, uh, mm -hmm. he would have been seen as a, a radical in the terms that they used um, in those times. You know, he was, for example, a supporter of um, extending the franchise to everybody, letting everybody vote. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, early which, which was, you know, just in terms of the way they categorized people politically, that, that was part of sort of the radical agenda. Um. You know, he, he was in some ways, I think, radical and in other ways, very conventional. Um, you know, he, he was uh, Western centric, maybe for lack of a better term. Um, he thought that the Western societies, while they still had many defects and things to learn from the rest of the world. I mean, he thought that sort of Western civilization was essentially on the right track compared to civilizations in other parts of the world. And it, had he been well-traveled working for the East India Company? Was that something he did within the scope of his job? Not the least bit. No, he never left Europe. So <laughs> in, in, in contrast, maybe with somebody like Edmund Burke or other people who'd been involved in the colonial enterprise, Mill never set foot in India. And, you know, despite the fact that and he didn't just work for the East India Company, he rose to a really high level within the company. Um, I, I think that with some justice, he could blame ill health. Uh, he had tuberculosis and he had a lot of digestive problems. It would have been hard for him to travel very widely. A lot of the travel he did was actually to get to better climates when his tuberculosis or his wife's was acting up. Um, but no, I mean, it, it, it is true that, you know, he, he makes some claims about how people in other parts of the world live that he didn't necessarily have the strongest evidence for. And I, I guess we should probably mention, but the East India Company, it was a trading company, correct? Yeah, I mean, it, it essentially ran India um, for the British um even before it was, you know, actually part of the British government. I mean, it, it essentially ran India for Britain. Um, so it, it was not, it was not just a company that sent ships to India and, and purchased things and brought them back. I mean, they, they, they really ran India as a colony. Mm. So in 1859, he publishes On Liberty what was the inspiration for his writing it? As you state, it was kind of different than things he had written before. Well, um, he, he and Harriet together thought that, um, well, in, in one letter, Mill actually describes On Liberty and, and some other things as a kind of, uh, mental pemmican 
he says. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. The, the, the kind of uh, dried meat and berries that Native Americans might have used as sort of survival food. Mm-hmm. That um, they thought that, despite what I just said about his believing that overall Western societies were somewhat more advanced than, than others, he thought that still the, the level of intellectual quality in the West was fairly low, and especially in England. And so they, they saw on liberty as something that future thinkers would be able to, to benefit from, something that they didn't necessarily think would be appreciated in its time. Um, but they, they saw Victorian society as kind of stultifying, uh, confining. Um, to some extent, I think this probably reflects the fact that their own relationship had been kind of scandalous by Victorian standards. Um, when, when they first met, Harriet was actually married to another man. Mm. And um, she and Mill very quickly were spending enormous amounts of time alone together. Um, her husband actually at one point six out of seven nights of the week would go to his club so that Mill could, could come to their house. Now they insisted that this was completely chaste, And I think today, most of us probably believe that it was, but by Victorian standards, I mean, you just couldn't do that. And so there was a lot of gossip. There was a lot of tittering. And I've always thought that had to contribute to the, to them thinking that, um, it just wasn't possible for people to be themselves, that, that people were too hemmed in by convention, by tradition, by what society expected. And so on liberty, whether or not that I'm right, that that detail about themselves was the motivation, that's the kind of thing that in general on liberty is reacting against. Well, 1859 was sort of an earth-shattering year when we're talking about level the level of discourse and uh, new discoveries. I mean, that was the year that I believe Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species was published. Uh, and w- when John Stuart Mill uses as an example in On Liberty religion to kind of point to the one thing that you can't question, uh, the in walks Charles Darwin, of course, with On the Origin of Species and perhaps creates a case study for some of the arguments that John Stuart Mill discusses. And Mill had some appreciation of, of Darwin. And, you know, of course, you don't see it in On Liberty. But Mill also wrote some things about religion. And to an extent that today kind of surprises, I think, a lot of people who, who study Mill. Uh, I just read a very nice book about this by Timothy Larson, Well, Mill wasn't a Christian. He actually saw a lot that was positive in Christianity and actually thought that what we call today sometimes the design argument was a pretty good argument for some kind of creator, some kind of designing intelligence. But in his last essay, where he talks about these kinds of issues, he also says, in essence, this clever fellow named Charles Darwin has just published a, a book that offers a different explanation for why it seems like we see evidence of design in nature. And this looks pretty good, and we'll have to see whether this holds up or not. But if it does, then that really probably takes away the one respectable intellectual reason for believing in some kind of creator. Oh, interesting. So you say he... He probably wasn't a Christian, correct? I, he certainly was not a Christian. Because um, in On Liberty, he kind of comes across as one, though he comes off as very skeptical. I mean, insofar as he, it seems like he makes the arguments he makes in On Liberty from a Christian perspective to reach a Christian audience. He, he, he you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, first of all, Mill was not during his lifetime. Um, he he really just didn't discuss his religious views. 
And the work in which he talks about this was work that was published uh, posthumously. Um, he, he certainly knows who he's writing for. And in On Liberty, he makes some arguments that are clearly meant to appeal to a Christian audience. And he, he somewhat affects a... I'm trying to th- I'm trying to think of a delicate way to put this. Um, <laughs> he, he he probably pretends to be a bit more of a Christian than he is, although you know again w- w- without strictly being a Christian, he does see much to admire in Christianity. So it's it's not as if he's stretching that much. Well, there is there is a concern about your ability to reach a predominantly Christian audience by coming out as a non-Christian. And we saw what happened to Thomas Paine after he published The Age of Reason. I mean, he was essentially led away at his burial by um, paupers, uh, people who were looking to pick at his estate, which was very little at that time. He died destitute. So there, there was a concern by about coming out as a non-Christian uh, obviously in Thomas Paine's time, but presumably in, in Mill's time as well. Yes, that, that that's right. So let's, let's get into On Liberty Now, the crux of it. You said that he came from an a-traditional household. Uh, he, he met his wife while she was still married to another man, and society, Victorian society at that time, was uh, not accepting of, of that sort of arrangement. And in On Liberty, he begins it by saying that it's an examination of the nature and limits of the power which can be legitimately exercised by society over the individual. And earlier in this conversation, we kind of talked about what he believed the nature of those limits were. Um, But he goes on to say that in, in the part which merely concerns himself, the individual, his independence is of right absolute over himself, over his own body and mind. The individual is sovereign. He also says the only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their effort to obtain it. Each is the proper guardian of his own health, whether bodily or mental or spiritual. Spiritual. Mankind are greater gainers by suffering each other to live as seems good to themselves than by compelling each to live as seems good to the rest. That's a pretty blatant refutation of a lot of the social trends and political trends, perhaps, that were happening in Victorian England at the time? Well, a, a rejection, if, yeah. if not a refutation. Um, you know, it, this might be a good time to say a little bit more about the, the principle that you uh, read earlier, uh, mm-hmm. the, the liberty principle or the harm principle. Mill says that the the object of the essay is just to assert and defend that one principle, uh, which probably when you read the essay isn't true. There's a lot of different stuff going on there, um, but you know he clearly sees that as at the heart of the essay. But it's important to be clear about exactly what this liberty or harm principle says and what it it doesn't say. So one way to to read it, and and what I think is the best way, is is to take it to say that preventing other people from being harmed is the only reason that could count in favor of restricting the freedom, the liberty of an adult. So what that doesn't say is that Society always ought to step in whenever one person is harming another and prevent that. What it says is, in essence, preventing other people from being harmed is a necessary condition for society to be justified in interfering. And this is important for Mill because he thinks, in fact, we do things all the time that we ought to do. We ought to be allowed to do that harm other people. He thinks this about economic competition. You know, if you're running a store and I open a store down the street that offers consumers a better deal, I take your customers away. 
Mill thinks I've harmed you, but he doesn't think that society ought to prevent that. Didn't Mill think that there should be some sort of population control and that economic growth wasn't that shouldn't be allowed to expand uh, unregulated. Am I remembering his thinking there correctly? Well, vaguely correctly. Yeah. Um, Mill thought, and this goes back to his, um, his economics, which come from a largely from an earlier economist named David Ricardo. Uh, Mill thought that economic growth at some point would just naturally stop. Um, you know, and, and, and just as a matter of kind of basic economic laws. And I'm not going to try to rehash exactly why he thinks that, because I didn't review that part of Mill. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, but he believes this. And he believes that we shouldn't be having too many kids, um, partly because he believes this drives down wages. You know, that if you've got more potential workers, then people are going to get paid less for working. Uh, He believed they they didn't really have any very effective birth control back then. Mm -hmm. Um, But we know now that Mills was arrested as a young man for distributing some literature, outlining kind of some ideas about birth control in working class neighborhoods. I mean, so he, he would have been a big proponent of the very effective birth control that we have right now. Um, He believed that parents shouldn't have kids that they weren't able to to feed, to take care of. He even suggests that couples shouldn't be allowed to marry unless they can show they have the means to support children, you know, which is kind of quaint for us today to think (laughs) that only within marriage would people be having children. So, you know, you, you could make sure that you didn't have any kids that you couldn't afford as long as, you know, you, you couldn't get married until you had enough money. Um, but, you know, he, he's not, when you say population control, that could mean different things to different people. I mean, you know, Mill's the last person who's going to want um, eugenics or something. Some yeah. Kind of, yeah, some <laughs> kind of draconian, you know, government regime of population control. That That's not. But some of the things you were talking about before, and this is where I'm trying to parse out what he really means uh when you say he he believes people should do this or should do that is he does he advocate for government and intervention in doing those sorts of things uh or or does he not because based on the reading of on liberty it seems as though you know people are free to do whatever they want so long as they they don't harm other people but you could define harm so expansively that almost everything can be harmful to, to someone. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the, this is, um, I mean, it's very much an issue in interpreting Mill uh, to think about how he understands the notion of harm. And it's important for thinking about how to understand him on free speech. Um, Mill never actually tells us what, what counts as harm. I mean, he never really gives a definition of harm. And, you know, that is, I think, a, a weakness in the essay. Um, although Mill, Mill is trying to write for a very wide audience, and so he values readability and accessibility a lot. And, you know, so that, I think, leads him to just take some things for granted that if he had been writing for a more scholarly audience, he would have felt the need to go into more detail about. You know, if you, if you contrast the writing style of On Liberty with some of his more technical work like the system of logic. It's, it's very different. Um, what Mill seems to have in mind, I think, when he talks about harm, is that we've got certain interests. We've got an interest in our, our life, our health, our money. Uh, we've got an interest in security. Mill seems to think we have an interest in privacy. And that to harm us is to damage those interests. So not everything that that happens to me that I wish hadn't happened necessarily counts as harming me. I mean, just because something makes me unhappy doesn't mean I've been harmed by it. You know, somebody who is a a homophobe 
might be really unhappy to think that this gay couple has moved in down the block. But Mill wouldn't think that they were being harmed by that. So to take the example that we discussed earlier of stealing a loaf of bread, I, I re- realize that's probably a cliche in philosophical circles. Uh, but what would he have thought of that? Would he have thought that the person in the wrong was the person who stole the loaf of bread from the rich merchant to steal their family? Well, you know, it's kind of a question here about how far back you want to go. <laughs> I mean, for, for first, I mean, of course, Mill would have thought that it's not okay to be a thief. Um, and he would have thought that theft is harm. And he would have thought that theft is a harm that society ought to do something about. You know, remember I said that he doesn't necessarily think that society or the government needs to try to prevent all kinds of harm. He would have thought that theft is a harm that we ought to be trying to prevent. Mm -hmm. However, he also believed in something like a universal basic income. Mill would not have thought that anybody ought to be in the position of having to steal a 10 cent loaf of bread to prevent their family from starving. Um, So, you know, in, in some sense, in a, in a million world, that's not a scenario that would arise in the first place. Okay. So, what would you make of his arguments about the tyranny of the majority? Because when we get talking about how he thinks society should take into account people that are living their own autonomous, independent lives, he talks about how oppression doesn't just come from government. It can also come from social constraints. Uh, He says the will of the people, moreover, practically means the will of the most numerous or the most active part of the people, the majority, or those who succeed in making themselves accepted as the majority. He's talking essentially about democracy here. The people consequently may desire to oppress a part of their number and Precautions are as much needed against this as against any other abuse of power. And then he goes on to say society can and does execute its own mandates, presumably outside of the scope of government. And if it issues wrong mandates instead of right or any mandates at all in the things which it ought not to meddle, it practices a social tyranny more formidable than many kinds of political oppression since, though not usually upheld by such extreme penalties, it leaves fewer means of escape penetrating much more deeply into the details of life and enslaving the soul itself. So I guess the thing that I have a hard time wrapping myself around is where does Mill see a role for the state? Where does he see a role for the society, I guess, to regulate outside of official state action? And, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it seems like a difficult thing for me to, me to grapple with. Well, the idea of the tyranny of the majority, I think Mill actually got from Tocqueville, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville and his his two-volume work, Democracy in America. Um, Mill was a big fan of this. Uh, He and Tocqueville never met, but they corresponded for a lot of years. Mill actually wrote some long reviews of democracy in America that were kind of the introduction of this work to English speaking readers. And when you asked me before about Mill's motivation for writing on liberty, this was something else I I should have talked about. Um, Tocqueville came over in the 1830s, I believe, maybe it was very late 1820s. Uh, He was a Frenchman who came over to America, ostensibly to study our prison system. But what he wrote instead was this major sociological treatise about American society. And there was a lot here that he admired, but part of what concerned him was how much people felt pressured to obey social norms that that weren't necessarily enforced by the government. I mean, you know, they weren't laws. But just to do what was expected of them. And, and, and you know, the, the, the way that people would, through ostracism or other kinds of, of techniques, informally punish their neighbors for not conforming to these norms. 
we see this today sort of in the the cancel culture dialogue that goes on about people well we we probably see it in in various places mm-hmm. i mean you know that that would be one um you know you could talk about harassment on twitter you know as, yeah. as another right um Tocqueville, I mean, rightly or wrongly, Tocqueville thought that this was, at least in part, and a result of the way that American society was so much more level than more aristocratic European societies. That in a more aristocratic society, you've got aristocrats that are basically immune to this kind of pressure. And if they're eccentric, you know, they're weird or they're, they're very individual. That gives everybody else a kind of cover in a way. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's hard for people to criticize you for doing something that the count of whatever is doing also. (laughs) Whereas in a society that is much more level, Tocqueville thinks it's actually much easier for society to exert this kind of pressure on people. And so, you know, this is something that that's very much in Mill's mind too. And the way that Tocqueville had approached this, I mean, what made him interested in studying America is that he thought this is the direction that Europe is headed. Europe is also becoming more democratic, not just in the voting sense, but in the sense of social equality. And so Europeans need to understand Americans in order to see what they're going to get. You know, and, and, and so Mill is to some extent, I think, writing on liberty as some kind of protection against what he sees as the negative side of something that on the whole he thinks is actually very beneficial. And what is that that he thinks is beneficial? These the leaving things up to uh, great, society. Greater equality. To... Gotcha. Um, you, you know, Mill was. Um, now, I'm not necessarily here talking about equality in terms of of money, although he'd have things to say about that too. Um, but you know, in terms of social equality, um, a rejection of station by birth. I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and so, you know, this gets back to something that I mentioned before about Mill wanting to extend the franchise, um, wanting to let not only the working class vote, but also women vote. Um, Mill was uh, briefly in Parliament in the 1850s, 60s, 1860s, and was the first person to propose there that women should be allowed to vote on equal terms with men. Didn't pass, but... You know, he, he was an egalitarian, but he also could recognize that there could be some negative consequences of greater equality along with a lot of positives. So let's move in now because I, I realize time has just flown by. We should talk about the free speech arguments that John Stuart Mill makes in the second chapter of On Liberty. The first chapter lays out the framework of what he's going to do in the entire essay, talks about uh, the nature of the limits of power, which can legitimately be exercised by society over the individual. He talks about tyranny of the majority, talks about the proper role of government. And then he says at the end of that introduction, uh, I want to first talk about the freedom of expression or the freedom of inquiry, because he says, more or less says without saying it, that that is the matrix, you know, it's the indispensable condition of nearly every other form of freedom in it. And it speaks to more sorts of freedom, greater sorts of freedom. Um, is that, had, had Mill written about free expression before, or was this kind of his launching off point? Was this the first time anyone had heard these arguments from him? There were things he had written before. I believe I'm correct to say that touched on this. Um, and, and including some, some early things that actually went in a somewhat different direction um, and were, were less supportive of free speech. Mm. But, you know, on, on liberty is really sort of the, the definitive statement, and, and nobody reading it would have thought it was just a rehash of things that he had done before. So in On Liberty, 
in this second chapter, he lays out more or less three arguments in favor of free expression. And he tackles uh, them head on. He says, you, you know, we need free speech because the speech or the expression that might be expressed might be true. He also says we need free speech because it might be false. And then he says we need free expression because it might be partially true or partially false. Uh, he says to, uh, if an opinion is compelled to silence, that opinion may, for aught we can certainly know, be true. And he said to deny this is to assume our own infallibility. He says, secondly, though the silenced opinion be an error, this is if it is incorrect, it may and very commonly does contain a portion of the truth. And since the general or prevailing opinion on any subject is rarely or never the whole truth, it is only by the collision of adverse opinions that the remainder of the truth has any chance of being supplied. And then he also talks about how um, even if an opinion is true, its collision with error gives a greater conception of the truth. Uh, it, it helps the arguer for that opinion argue, argue the truth more vigorously. It, it holds, they, they fail to hold it as a prejudice in that case or a dead dogma and it becomes a living truth. So I guess we can maybe go through some, I, I don't know the best way to do this. I'm kind of thinking through it as I go, go through some of his famous quotations in this section and discuss them. One of the, my favorite, uh, begins the essay. Uh, he says, if all of mankind minus one were of one opinion and only one person were of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power would be justified in silencing mankind. And this kind of goes back to his earlier thesis about the proper role of government that over himself, over his own body and mind, the individual is sovereign, correct? Right. And, and, and not just government, of course, but as, as we were talking about society as a whole, you know, Mill is as worried about threats to freedom of speech that come from extra legal sources as he is about state censorship. Yeah, I've always I've always wondered about that though because you know, getting back to the tyranny of of the majority, is he essentially arguing for people to not argue vociferously or if they hold a strong opinion and and, and I know at the end of this chapter he kind of says as much, but how are we supposed to convince other people of what is right and what is wrong without some sort of social pressure that comes from making the argument. Does that make sense? If it's pressure that comes from the argument, I mean, if, if it's intellectual pressure, right, it's, it's persuasion, it's, it's logic, it's, it's compelling research. That's not the kind of pressure that Mill is concerned about. You know, on the other hand, there are certain kinds of, social pressure that go beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to say too much about this because this could take us down a, a wormhole. I could keep you here all day. Um, I, I've been exercising my own freedom of speech at, at too great of length. I, <laughs> I realize in answering your questions, but um, so there, there's a project that I'm working on now that talks about uh, boycotts and when somebody like Mill might think that boycotts were justified as a response to things that were said and when he wouldn't think that, um, in some cases he might see a boycott as a kind of illegitimate social push. I'm looking here, I'm trying to find it in the essay, but there's a paragraph where he talks about um, – more animated ways of expressing oneself. So he, I think he references satire and uh, he takes on the argument that, okay, speech might be the allowing for vigorous expression might be okay, but only if it's argued rationally. Um, oh, but I can't find where it is in the essay and, and you know, there's, well, there's a lot else to go into there, but. Right. You know, one thing he says, and this may be uh, the, the passage that you have in mind, and it's, it's toward the end of the chapter, yeah. is that to the extent that we're going to try to enforce any kind of rules on 
the way in which discourse is conducted, the kinds of speech that are allowed, that we ought to be much more protective of the people who are expressing unpopular views than we are people who are expressing more popular ones. So, you know, so, so often what happens is that people who express unpopular views are criticized for the way that they, they do that, you know, that, that they're too dramatic, too provocative. Um, it's hard not to think about uh, Colin Kaepernick right now, for example, mm-hmm. given that, you know, he was just in the news because of this, um, this workout that he had. Um, you know, people will say, well, you know, it's, it's okay for you to believe that, but you shouldn't express it in this way. And I'm not going to try to figure out what Mill might think about Colin Kaepernick, but in general, he thinks we have to be more permissive when we're looking at people who express unpopular views than people who are expressing the mainstream view that if anybody ought to be given more latitude in terms of how they express themselves. It's them. So then to kind of reconcile my concern earlier, he places a great emphasis on that word majority and the tyranny of, of the majority. The idea being that, you know, social oppression uh, or social concern, if it's exercised by a majority, is more concerning than a vigorous uh, condemnation coming from a small minority, although sometimes even on Twitter you see a small minority that can force people into silence uh, based on the way they express themselves. Yeah, it, it, it's not just a, a question in numbers. It's a question of, of energy mm-hmm. and coordination also. Um, so yeah, it, it can certainly happen sometimes that, that it's a relatively small number who can exercise that kind of power. And, and Mill has a, a great concern in this chapter with the idea of fallibility or infallibility. He thinks, I mean, this is kind of the thing that animates most of his argument, the idea that we can't be so certain that we're right. Right. So, um, you know, as you said, Mill thinks about three cases that if society is wanting to censor, to suppress some, some viewpoint, to keep people from expressing it, that there are three possibilities. The view that they want to censor might be true. It might be false or, and, and for Mill, this is actually the, the most common case. It might be a mix. It might be partly true and, and partly false. And, and Mill thought that most people's beliefs were partly true and, and partly false. So the infallibility discussion comes in the first of these cases where he's considering the point that there's a good chance that any view that somebody wants to suppress or censor will actually turn out to be true. And against that, somebody might respond, well, no, in this case, we're just sure. We know this doctrine is false. We know that what, what we believe is the truth. You know, that, that's something the majority, for example, might say. And, you know, Mill argues, look, you're, you're just not justified in making that claim because in essence, you're claiming to be infallible and, and no one is. You might have good grounds for believing as you do, but part of those grounds has to be that people are allowed to disagree with you. And unless people have that freedom to express different views, the only way you could be sure you're right is if you think that that you're not capable of making mistakes. And he uses as an example here, Christianity as a view that it, it almost he almost suggests, and, and he might even go so far as to suggest that Christianity is true. But he says, even still, if we want it to be a vibrant Christianity, we need to let it to be sort of for the sake of argument, we might say he -hmm. he takes for granted in in the course of that discussion that that Christianity is true. And and then he points out that um, the, the people who persecuted Christianity, you know, for example, Marcus Aurelius had every bit as good of reason to censor Christianity as people in his time have to censor views that that they disagree with. And so, you know, essentially the argument is, um, do you think you're smarter than Marcus Aurelius? You know, (laughs) if, if he was capable of making this mistake, 
then don't you have to admit that you're capable of making mistakes also and mistaking true doctrines for false ones? So that's why he thinks it's in, important to allow for free expression, even if an opinion be true. But what about if we're confident that it is false? This is, this is where he gets into the idea that you get a greater conception of the truth through its collision with error. Yeah, I'm going to be a little picky about wording here, right? It's, it's, oh, please, yeah. The, the first case that he considers is one where people are confident that the doctrine is false, but it is in fact true. The second case he thinks about is one where people believe it's false and it really is. You know, so the doctrine that people want to censor, let's say for the sake of argument, they're right, that this doctrine really is mistaken. Well, even in this case, Mill thinks, it's important that people be allowed to express the doctrine, not because, you know, people who listen to them are going to be led to truth exactly, but because the very possibility of disagreement and argument changes the way that people who hold true beliefs hold them. You know, he, Mill believes that even if your beliefs are true, if you're not worried that you might have to debate somebody, you're not worried that you might have to defend those views, then you're going to hold them as, and you used this phrase earlier, dead dogmas, right? You're, you're likely to lapse into a kind of state where you give lip service to these ideas, but you don't really understand why you believe them, and they may not really make much of a difference to how you live. So. The example that, that Mill alludes to here, and it's one that I think will be a familiar probably to a lot of people in, in the U.S., is the Sunday Christian. You know, the person who goes to church, they sing the hymns, they say the prayers, and then they come out of church and the rest of the week they live in a completely unchristian way. Yeah. You know, for, for, for Mill, that person has embraced Christianity as kind of a dead dogma. And he would think the reason for that is they're not really worried about having to defend their Christianity, right? It's, uh, it's largely so much taken for granted here that, you know, they're, they're, they're not worried about suddenly needing to come up with some kind of justification for what they believe. As he says, you know, back in the days when Christians got thrown to lions, there may not have been a lot of Christians, but they certainly took it very seriously. You know, and, and it really informed the way they lived. So two of the most, I use the word here, beautiful quotes that come from this section is that he says, both teachers and learners go to sleep at their post as soon as there is no enemy in the field. And he continues, the fatal tendency of mankind to leave off thinking about a thing when it is no longer doubtful is the cause of half their errors. A contemporary author, he states, has well spoken of, quote, the deep slumber of a decided opinion, close quote. And I've always been curious who actually he is quoting there because he doesn't, he doesn't give a name, the deep slumber of a decided opinion. Do you happen to know? Well, not off the top of my head, but hey, I'm sitting at a computer, so let's find out. <laughs> we can look it up. We can look it up that way. Um, I, I that, that, that's something I'm sure I would have known at one time because I, uh, I, I once did some footnotes for a, uh, well, I, I'm seeing it attributed to him. Um, so I don't, yeah, if it's got a source before him, I, I don't know. I, I did some, some footnotes once for a, an edition of On Liberty where I had to research all of these things, but that was a long time ago. And a lot of those details I've, I've long lost. Yeah. Well, it's not a big deal. I've just, I, I thought I would ask cause I had an expert here. So that is the second justification for free speech or the sort of scenario in which he makes his argument for free, free speech or expression. Uh, and then there's the, the third, which as you stated earlier is perhaps the most important one and emblematic of more situations that we might find ourselves in. That is that an idea is partially true and partially false. Yeah. And, and, you know, Mill thinks that that is, like I said, the norm and Mill thought of himself, that kind of his, his intellectual contribution, what he was, was best at was not really coming up with entirely new ways of thinking himself, but finding the little bits of truth in different people's ideas and integrating them. 
making them coherent. And so, you know, in, in Mill, you find a mix of, for example, conservative and more liberal ideas. Uh, you find a mix of, you know, you might even say religious and, and atheistic ideas. Um, he was a, uh, a complex thinker in that way. But he thinks that that depends on free discussion, right? That, that depends on these people who have different pieces of the truth being able to engage with each other. And we haven't used this phrase yet, and it's not a phrase that Mill uses, but, you know, essentially the, the marketplace of ideas, right? That, yeah. That's where this gets sorted out. Is there any indication that John Stuart Mill had read John Milton's Areopagitica? Certainly a lot of commentators draw the comparison between the two. Off the top of my head, I don't recall specifically him saying that, but I'm almost certain that it would be the case that he did. And just as a, a funny little piece of trivia, Mill's family once lived in a house that, that belonged to Milton. Um, Oh, wow. It was actually, it was on a, if I remember this correctly, it was on a property that belonged to Bentham and, and Bentham was sort of putting them up. I may be conflating different residences there, but at any rate, yeah, they, they once, when he was young, lived in a house, um, which was rather too small for them that, that had been Milton's. So there, there, there is a line in Areopagitica and I'm, I can't quote it verbatim, but essentially, uh, John Milton's writes that, you know, who knows truth to be put worse to the wear in a free and open encounter with error. Um, and people have always seized on that as being inaccurate. Like there are times when truth loses to error. Uh, and I was struck that John Stuart Mill in On Liberty tackles this head on. And he says that the real advantage which truth has consists in this, that when an opinion is true, it may be extinguished once, twice, or many times. That is, it may lose when confronted with error. But in the course of ages, there will generally be found persons to rediscover it until someone of its reappearances falls, uh, will, uh, falls on a time when from favorable circumstances it escapes persecution until it has made such head as to withstand all subsequent attempts to suppress it. No, I'm not. I, I'm, I agree for the most part with that argument. Uh, I guess you wouldn't really know until you've gone through the ages, whether <laughs> all ages, uh, whether truth will, will survive um, because our lifetimes are limited. But I do appreciate that John Stuart Mill addresses that argument head on in a way that John Milton does. And that's kind of what leads me to ask the question as to whether John Stuart Mill had read John Milton and perhaps been unsatisfied with that argument as well. You know, that, that detail, I'm not going to, I, I, I don't know the answer to, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I think Mill would have no trouble recognizing that there are market failures in the marketplace of ideas, just like there are in every other marketplace. Mm -hmm. And of course, so much depends on educating people, right? I mean, the marketplace of ideas only works the way we want it to if we've got educated consumers, you know, uh, people who are able to recognize the difference between good and bad arguments, right? People who are able to reject fallacious reasoning. And so I had talked before about Mill being an, an egalitarian. A well, part of that was in his wanting everybody to receive an education, which in the 19th century obviously wasn't the case. Uh, not necessarily a state education. Mill was in favor of what today we would call vouchers, um, at least in some cases. But, you know, he believed that um, you've got to prepare people for the kind of liberty that he believes they ought to have. I want to ask, kind of by way of closing here, because we've I've kept you longer than I, I said I would keep you, about one shortcoming that appears in On Liberty. And it's a shortcoming that you find in John Milton's Areopagitica, too. In Areopagitica, John Milton argues for, um, or argues essentially against prior review. Uh, and, and in a certain sense, those arguments can be extended to freedom of expression. But he says, not for papists, not for Catholics. Uh, in 
On Liberty, John Stuart Mill says that despotism is a legitimate mode of government in dealing with barbarians, provided the end be their improvement and the means justified by actually effecting that end. Liberty, as a principle, he writes, has no application to any state of things anterior to the time when mankind have become capable of being improved by free and equal discussion. I mean, this is an argument for colonialism, if there ever was one, coming from a man who, of course, worked for East India Company. How has yeah? Well, I, I mean, we we know he was a colonial. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. That that passage is. Um, I mean, you know, certainly to use a popular word of the day, um, it's it's problematic. Um, and you know, as I I said before, Mill was sometimes willing to um, speak a little too freely about people in other parts of the world that he didn't really know that much about. You know, one thing I would say there is that Mill would apply that as much to earlier periods of Western society as to societies in other parts of the world. Um, and, and he wouldn't necessarily have applied it to every non-Western society in, in his day. Um, but yeah, Mill, Mill was a kind of cultural relativist. I mean, in the sense that you know, we, we, we started out by talking about his, his utilitarianism and what I suggested was his rule utilitarianism. He wouldn't necessarily think that the best sets of, the, the set of rules that's best in one time and place is best in every other. Would you say that John Stuart Mill, looking at America today with our first amendment framework would recognize his arguments within it and approve of the way that we've handled freedom of expression in the United States, at least from a governmental perspective to speak nothing of his concerns regarding the tyranny of the majority. You know, I think that, um, on the whole, he would think we got it right. Um, you know, there, there's a funny little passage. It's not in chapter two. Um, it comes later in the uh, the essay uh, where he talks about society being able to regulate offenses against decency. Um, and it really, it's a very brief passage and it comes out of nowhere. And we've never really known what to do with this. Um, I, I suspect, though, and this probably reflects his Victorian sensibilities, that Mill would think that in some ways we've gone further with free speech than he was willing to. Um, you know, for example, in terms of things like, I don't know, erotic dancing or something like that, being given First Amendment protection. Um, I, I don't know that Mill would necessarily see something like that as falling under the kinds of arguments that he gives in chapter two. His focus is much more on intellectual discussion. Although, you know, there, there are things in other parts of the essay that, that would still, I think, probably support that kind of freedom. It's just that Mill might not frame that as a free speech issue the way that, that First Amendment law has. Well, that's one of the issues that we who work in the free expression sphere, uh, it's one of the things we see often is we will make an argument for free expression, but someone will say, oh, no, that's not free speech. That's that's conduct, for example. Or, oh, you know, nude dancing, as to take an example you put before. Well, that's not that's not free expression. That's a that's a sort of conduct. And and First Amendment scholars sometimes look at uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech uh, as as a phrase that requires definition, the freedom of speech. What does the freedom of speech mean? What is encompassed within that rather than the whole, than accepting that speech, anytime you express yourself, that is expression. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's a challenge. And people who look to censor are always looking to define that which they seek to censor, to censor outside of the definition of freedom of speech. Right. And, you know, I, I think that I, I think that Mill could be misused in a certain kind of way. Um, and that was going to be kind of my last question there is, are, are free speech ag, ag, advocates misusing 
mill and when they use him to make arguments. You know, I was actually thinking more the opposite. I was mm. thinking more the, the person who wants to shut down speech. If, if, if they just pointed to chapter two by itself, I think they could say, you know, look, here, here's the classic case for freedom of speech. And it doesn't cover this activity that we're wanting to shut down. It doesn't apply. I, I think the misuse would be not to read chapter three, not to read chapter four, um, because there may be certain kinds of activities that Mill wouldn't want to frame a speech, but that he would still believe ought to be protected from social interference. It's just that he would put them under a different heading. Yeah. So, you know, it would be that kind of cherry picking reading of Mill that, I, I don't have a great example off the top of my head of somebody actually doing this, but as we're talking, I can see how Mill might be liable to be misused in this way. Well, I'm looking here in chapter five, and he's got a paragraph here. He says, again, there are many acts which, being directly injurious only to the agents themselves, ought not to be legally interdicted, but which, if done publicly, are a violation of good manners, and coming thus within the category of offenses against others, may rightfully be prohibited. Of this kind are offenses against decency. So in that case, you might argue that public nudity, though doesn't it doesn't really harm anyone else, if done publicly, he says, it could be a violation of good manners. And if it, even yeah, if- Yeah, that, that's the- that, that's the passage that I mentioned earlier, that it's, it's just really hard to know what to do with. Um, and, and it, you know, it's, it's a case in which I think Mill would have almost, and, you know, these are the Victorian sensibilities at work. He, he probably couldn't have brought himself to talk about examples, right? I mean, he, he probably couldn't really do much more to help us understand what he had in mind because he was such a Victorian gentleman. He couldn't bring himself to, to talk about those things you know, in, in, in the first place. Um, I, I like to think that, you know, he struggles with, he struggled in his time with his own issues in the same times we, in, at the same time that we struggle with our own contemporary issues as well. I mean, accepting a very broad, expansive protection framework for expression in America today requires allowing for people to express some pretty abhorrent things. I mean, his, uh, blasphemy is our hate speech that we deal with today. Um, and and well, it, if you're going to make a consistent maybe. philosophical argument uh, in favor of free speech, you need to be willing, it seems to me, to defend it at the extremes. You know, there, there, there are hard cases. Um, hate speech, I think, is probably different from blasphemy in that with hate speech, you know, we, we, we've said that for Mill, if behavior is harmful, that doesn't automatically mean that society ought to regulate it, but at least it means that society has the choice to make. Mm -hmm. um, as, he, as he puts it in some cases, if it's harmful, that puts it in society's jurisdiction. And with hate speech, you know, I, I think hate speech is a really broad term. Well, that's you get in the that same issue a lot of with that you get with harm and what is good. I mean, we've talked a lot here about using those terms to determine uh, a path forward for society, and I think you get into that same vagueness problem with hate speech as well. I mean, one person's hate speech one might be another person's great truth. That that's well, right. I mean, certainly there will be disagreement about what counts as hate speech. It may be that some of the things that we count as hate speech really are harmful. And if they are, then that would mean that Mill's principle doesn't protect them from social interference. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on First Amendment law, but in First Amendment jurisprudence, for example, we have this idea of fighting you know, the idea that certain kinds of words are themselves so, so harmful, so provocative that society is able to step in and say, okay, in these circumstances, you're not allowed to say this. And Mill's doctrine, I think, supports it. Yeah, the, but the, even in the case law defining fighting words, you find this vagueness problem. Uh, 
you know, that, that fighting words doctrine comes from a case in which a Jehovah's Witness told a police officer who refused to prevent a mob from attacking him that the police officer was a goddamn racketeer. Uh, you know, th- those were the fighting words of those days. Um, and so in a certain sense, it can be in the eye of the beholder in the same way that harm can be in the eye of the beholder or good can be in the eye of the, be- the beholder. Um, and, and people also like, and this, and this is what where the challenge you get into when you start t- t- creating carve outs for uh, freedom of expression. People like to say, "Well, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater." Uh, that might be true, um, and that might be prescribed yeah, I, by law. I, I think that's true. Yeah, you falsely, and, and people often forget falsely. You can't falsely shout fire in a crowded theater. If there is a, a fire in your theater, you should probably shout that, <laughs> that there is a fire. But it was it was a it was a phrase that came into being from Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in the context of him and the rest of the court throwing in jail a group of socialists protesting World War I. The, fi- the, the theater in that case was the theater of war and the fire that was being created, they said, was being created by these anti-war protesters. So you know, people always find unique ways to use the carve-outs for freedom of expression to justify the, the censorship of the speech that they want where – and this gets back to Mill talking about how our uh, you know, times change. Uh, you look 50 years from now and you say, we really threw someone in jail for calling a police officer a goddamn racketeer and justifying it under a fighting words doctrine? Or we really s- threw socialists into jail in the early part of the 20th century for um, anti-war protest uh, and justified it by saying that they were essentially shouting fire, f- falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater? So that, that's the challenges that we all try and grapple with. I mean, people can always come up with an argument for harm that not everyone in society might see as harmful. I, I mean, I could imagine during Mill's Day um, arguments uh, in favor of blasphemy laws, the idea being that it would whittle away at the moral fabric of society. Uh, and you actually or, got or that. Or Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Yeah. Um, no, I, I look, I, I think that's certainly true. And Mill's doctrine, just like any other, is not self-applying. Mm-hmm. Um, Mill doesn't give us this kind of algorithm that we can use so that we can arrive at complete social consensus about when censorship is or isn't justified. But what it does do, at least, is give us a kind of framework that we can use to structure the disagreement so that if somebody wants to claim that censorship is justified, Here's the kind of case they have to make. And in some cases, at least, they're probably not going to be able to say anything very convincing in those terms, even if they can come up with some kind of cooked up rationale about how somebody is being harmed. Well, Professor, I think uh, we'll leave it there. Do you have any last words, any last thoughts about Mill and On Liberty that we should leave our audience with that I didn't get to in my, uh, you know, winding way of questioning? Well, so many, I suppose. Um, <laughs> we'll have to have you, you know, back. I, well, well, I, I would just leave it with this, that, that Mill, as I said, really was writing for a wide audience. And everyone who's listening ought to, to read on liberty. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily a page turner that you won't put down once you start it. Um, only a few of us maybe had that reaction to it. But, but everybody ought to read it. I mean, you're, you're, you're not an educated person in our world today if you haven't read it. Well, I first read it when I was an intern here at the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. It was required reading. And it was a page turner for me insofar it was, as it was like a revelation some of the arguments that he was making. I mean, he was taking the best arguments for censorship and in my eyes, turning them on their head. He was taking the best possible argument they had on their side, that an idea is false um, uh, and saying, well, we should still allow it for these ways, uh, for these reasons. Uh, so I do encourage our listeners to, to check it out. Uh, there's also a recently released, I think it was uh, Jonathan Haidt and Richard Reeves who put out uh, All Minus One, which is, I guess is like an abridged version of chapter two and it's graphically illustrated. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, I recommend reading the entirety of chapter two, but yeah, yeah. You, you, you don't need, um, w- w- with all due respect to uh, Hyatt <laughs> and, and Reeves, um, both of whose work I've, I've read and, and profited from, 
Um, you don't need cliff notes for on liberty. Just, <laughs> just dive right in. Yeah. And it's, and it can be found free online too, for anyone who's interested. And uh, I'll link it in the show name, show notes. Well, uh, yeah, Professor- well, you know, in, in fact, I mean, maybe um, if I can just stick in one other thing worth mentioning, yeah. um, a lot of your listeners are probably familiar with the group Liberty Fund. Mm-hmm. Liberty yeah. Fund did an amazing thing a few years ago, which is that they bought the rights from the University of Toronto Press to the entire 33 volumes of John Stuart Mill's collected works and made the PDFs available freely online in their online library of liberty. So oh, wow. not only are there a million free copies of On Liberty floating around on the internet, but essentially every word that Mill ever published is available freely. Wow. So, you know, th- this is about, I'd say, four feet on a, uh, a bookshelf <laughs> worth, of, worth of Mill. So well, get started. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might it might take you a couple of years, but I'm sure it's well worth the effort. I will try and hunt that down from the Liberty Fund, which is based in Indianapolis, I believe. I, I went to school at yeah. Indiana University Bloomington, so I always like to hear of pe- folks in Indiana doing good stuff. I will try and hunt that down, and I will link it in the show notes. And Professor, I really appreciate you coming on and lending your insights. All right. Well, thanks very much. That was Old Dominion Professor Dale E. Miller. To learn more about him and his work, you can visit his webpage, drdaleemiller.net. That is D-R-D-A-L-E-E-Miller.net. Two E's in there, daleemiller.net. And to learn more about John Stuart Mill and his essay on liberty, you can check out the show notes where I'll have a bevy of links for you to pursue or peruse, including the aforementioned Liberty Fund Collection. This podcast is hosted, produced, and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash freespeechtalk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at the fire.org, or you can call in a question for a future show, maybe our 100th episode panel discussion at 215-315-0100. You don't actually have to speak to someone when you call that number. You just leave a message with your question and I will present it in a subsequent episode. Again, that number is 215-315-0100. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. Those reviews help us attract new listeners to this show. And until next time, our 100th episode. Thank you again for listening.